So uh, we are going to this morning start something a little different. We're going to move to the book of James. So if you've been here, we've kind of been uh, working through the life of Abraham a little bit. But we're going to start a new series today where we're going to look at the whole book of James. We're going to start in the beginning and go to the end. And I love the book of James because it's really... Um, it's like home ec for Christians. All right, did anybody here take home ec? You remember that? Did you teach, you taught home ec? Uh, it's, it, it's almost like Christianity 101. How do you just live? How do you be? How do we exist in a world that is uh, uh, turned away from God? And how do, we, how do we do this thing called Christianity? And so as we start this, I want you to recognize that the theme of James is going to really, he's going to focus on how we live out our faith. So it's kind of like faith in action, so to speak. And, and as we look through this, you're going to see faith from a different perspective. Okay, I have a little graphic that's going to be on the screen. Because when you read a lot of the Bible, uh, a lot of the New Testament specifically, Paul talks a lot about faith. And t Paul talks about a faith that saves. So um, we're going to hear James bring up things that are going to challenge or are going to seem to challenge the idea of a saving faith and what Paul says it is. But it's because they're looking at faith from two different directions. So Paul is looking at a faith that saves, while James is looking at a working faith or a faith that serves. And so what you want to see as we go through this, and we'll be explaining this as we get deeper into the text, but that's really what this, this text is about. It's about how we as Christians live out this faith. Not just a vertical faith that I believe in Jesus, but what is, it, what is it to actually be a Christian and live by faith? Paul said this in Ephesians 2, uh, 8, 9, and 10. He said, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. That's what he's talking about. That salvation is uh, the faith that uh, we are saved through faith. He's talking about this eternal, this almost vertical view of faith. But then he goes on into uh, verse 10 as he just moves down from that and he says, For you are, created, you are God's workmanship, created by God to do good works, which he prepared beforehand. And that's what he's meaning by now it's a faith that serves. And that's what James is going to focus on as we kind of get into it. One thing you're going to notice about the book of James, it's 108 verses long. It's only, uh, I think, five chapters long. Um, but what you're going to see is out of those 108 verses, 54 verses are what we call imperatives. Now, an imperative is a command. So half of the book is going to give us direct actions on the things that we can apply. It's an extremely practical book. And that's kind of why I wanted us to launch it as we got into our new building. I wanted us to kind of look at something new and really get down to some practical Christianity. One thing we've been looking at in the life of Abraham is we have seen Abraham, uh, how he's had to live out his faith in a world um, that is uh, not a vacuum. You know, we talk about faith in churches and we talk about Christ uh, in Christianity today and how we're to live out our faith. But we also recognize that the realities of life set in and, and, and our Christian life is not lived in a vacuum. It sounds great on paper, but when we actually start to live it and apply it, it's a little different. We saw that with Abraham. He's called by God out of Ur into this new land. And then you see a great picture of a guy having to live out his faith. In a, in, a, in a world that's kind of uh, around him that's pagan. Well, James does the same thing, except he actually goes, okay, this is what it actually looks like to do that. So that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks, okay? So turn in, if you would, in your Bible to James chapter 1, verse 1. What James does right off the bat, which I think is really good, is he addresses the concept of right off the bat that the world is broken and you and I have to live in it. He doesn't start with big theological premises or uh, suppositions that, that bring us to these lofty ideas. He starts right with where you're at, that there is going to be hard times, there is trials. And so we're going to look today at what it means to grow up without giving up, all right? So here's the question we're going to kind of uh, look at. How do we maintain a right perspective, a right perspective of faith in tough times, all right? So he starts off by this. Look at verse 1 with me. He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Now let me, let me walk you through this real quick. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. They have the same mama, Mary. 
But you guys know this, that Jesus was born of God through Mary. She was a virgin. And therefore, James, his daddy, was Joseph. And if you remember this, James, uh, the Bible says that the brothers of Jesus did not recognize him as Messiah until after his death and resurrection. And here he is writing a book about his brother. Um, another interesting thing about James is he was the, uh, what we call a bishop, he was the lead pastor in Jerusalem after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. The church recognized him because of who he was and they put him into a, a position of leadership. And so this guy, uh, from a Jewish audience, he was the, the, the big Christian dog. All right? He's the big dog on campus. All right? Now, I want to give you an illustration of, of, of this. He calls himself the bondservant. That's the Greek word for doulos. It's what we would use. We would call it a slave, a, a chosen slave. Would you say that about your sibling? Would you call yourself... <laughs> you're smiling. Would you, call, <laughs> would you call yourself the slave to your brother or sister? Okay, we just so happens to be that my sister is here today. All right? Um, Muffet, where are you? I couldn't find you earlier. There she is. Okay, there's my sister. Okay, Muff, listen. <laughs> Would you call me the Messiah? Come on. Okay. I kind of figured you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had a feeling. I had a feeling you weren't going to. Okay, so I'm not the Messiah. Would you, let's, let's just take it a step backwards. Would you call me, uh, would you say that you are my slave? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> didn't think so. Now, the reason I asked Muff is because she knows me. She knows I'm an idiot, right? She knows I'm crazy. She knows that if I stood up before everybody and said, I'm the son of God, if I stood before the governor of the state and he said, are you the king of the Jews? And I said, yes, she's going to go, uh, uh, liar. She's going to point me out. So for this guy, this half-brother to say, I am the slave. I am the bondservant of God. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's pretty authentic. It's a pretty big deal, right? Now, he's writing this specifically to Jewish Christians. He says the 12 tribes. So he's, he's focusing the text on Jewish Christians. And you see this, believe it or not, there's over 21 different references to Old Testament texts throughout the book of James. And so he's writing specifically to the Jews. Something interesting here, he makes also over 12 references to the Sermon on the Mount. Now, don't you know that when Jesus, his half-brother, was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, James is sitting there going, really? Oh, my gosh. He internalized it so much that in the book, you see these, these, these uh, spirit of the law kind of ideas brought back into the book. And so he, as he gives them out. So he's writing this to Jewish Christians who are dispersed abroad. So now we get to our, main, our first point here. On your, if you have a little sheet, I'll pull this up real quick. If you're new, you can, if you like to take notes, I kind of, I try to give a, a little way that you can do that. The first thing you'll see, and look, we all love alliteration, we all love things, so everything's going to start with an A this morning, okay? So the first thing you're going to see is the attitude in trials. And he's going to address our attitude. So look at what he says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Stop right there. He's talking about our attitude. Trials come. We, we all know this, right? It's, it's not new. It's not new that things are going to be bad for us, that we're going to have tough times. And he tells us specifically that as these things come, your job as a Christian in this world is to look at them with joy. Now, he's not saying have, be joyful because of it. He's not saying, oh, that, that um, be, don't be joyful for the trial. Oh, thank you. Bless you, God, that I've had this car wreck. Bless you that my brother just died or my, my dad passed away. Bless you, Lord. He's not saying that. He's saying that you, your job is to have joy in it. And there's a difference. You don't have to be just like, bring it on, God. But your job, our job as Christians, is to be joyful in the midst of it. And he says, uh, all joy or pure joy, this is to be full of joy in the midst of these trials. Keep going with me. Look at verse 3. We're going to look at what is the advantage of the trials. Here's the advantage. He says, because knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 
The, the word knowing is knowing through experience. So this is not, um, this is not a head knowledge. This is an experiential knowledge. Okay? It's gnoskantos. It's, the, it's the, the knowledge that we gain through living. I'll give you a quick story about myself. Um, I, I may have told this story before, but one time um, when I was real little, um, my mom had cooked some cookies, and she brought the cookies out of the oven, and she set them on top of the stove, on top of the, the oven there. And I was little. I was so little that I c couldn't see over, I, I can remember this, but I couldn't see over the top of the stove. And I can remember going up there and just reaching up to get a cookie, right? Didn't ask, just was going for it. Mom said, whoa, 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 don't do that. It's hot. It's hot. I was like, okay. Okay. Backed off, and you can. I'm probably three, so it's not like, cool, mom. It's probably something else. But um, I back away, and I tried again. I can rem I can remember her. She had to tell me. She said, "It's hot. It will burn you. It will burn you." And so it's okay. And we were in this house where the bedroom that I lived, that we stayed in, was kind of off of the kitchen. And so I can remember going into the bedroom, and I was in there, and she was in the kitchen, and she left the kitchen and went into the dining room, and I walked back into the kitchen, over to the stove. And I reached up on the stove, and I grabbed a cookie. And as I grabbed the cookie, my little fingertips seared to the top of the cookie sheet. Ah! All right? Now, do you think I ever did that again? Well, probably. Let's be honest. <laughs> After the second or third time, do you think I did that again? No, because I learned. Now, the first time, did I know? Yes, I knew because my mother, my guide, my protector, my shepherd, where were you? Um, the, the, <laughs> she protected me. She gave me the knowledge. But there's an experiential knowledge that came from that that I learned from with little blisters on my fingers, right? That's the word here, gnoskantos. He says, knowing that the testing, this is the approved part. The approved part of our faith um, produces endurance. It is the quality, this is the word endurance, it is the quality of staying on one's feet in the middle of a storm. That's the endurance. Now, if you've ever ran a race, you understand this. You don't prepare for a, a marathon by preparing for a, a, a 5K. If you've done all this work to get ready for a 5K and you enter into a marathon, you're going to die, right? It's going to be horrible. So the idea is that these trials are there to test our faith that we might be able to last the marathon. Keep looking at your text here. Verse 4. It says, And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect. In other words, the one who fulfills the purpose which God has created him for. You can be perfect. Not perfect as in sinless. God, believe it or not, did not create you to be sinless. He created you to do good works. He created you for a purpose. To live on this earth for him. And that's what he's talking about here. Keep going. Um, that you may be perf perfect. Perfect. And complete, the word complete here is fully attaining to the higher calling. It's maturity. That there's this growing up stage, lacking nothing. A couple weeks ago, I'm, I'm an upwards basketball coach for my son. And a couple weeks ago, we were playing basketball. And Quinn was playing ball. <coughs> and we were actually winning the game. <laughs> I say that like it's a surprise. Um, <laughs> we were winning the game. and But Quinn, man, he had this... This opponent who was really on him, just dogging him. And uh, she was a girl, and she was a little taller than him, and she was a little faster than him, and she was all over him. And I can remember, uh, it was like getting, uh, it was the second half, it was the middle of the second half, and we put new, we got a, you know, after the quarter, and I get all the kids lined up for the next quarter, and, and we're, uh, I'm lining everybody up, and I'm telling them, okay, you're, this is you, you're playing against, and blah, blah, blah. And, and he sees this girl. And he realizes that he's got to play her. And he turns just like, Dad. He's like, I don't want to play against. It's like, she's, I got to play. This is what he said. He goes, I got to play against her again? I said, yeah. And he's like, can't I play against somebody else? I'm like, why? He's like, because she's like, she's hard. I said, yes. 
I know she's hard. I know that she's just destroying you. <laughs> and that's good. I said, I don't want you to leave because guess what? You're good too. You're good too. You can handle this. And she is making you a better player. She's making you better. I said, so if I get put you on this kid over here, who, yeah, you can beat, but guess what? You get no better. You don't grow at all. He still didn't like it. <laughs> but he got better, right? And that's the idea here is that the advantage, which in the midst of it, we don't see the advantages of these trials, but in the midst of them, we have an advantage that we're going through this for a reason. I, it's so easy for us to, to, when something comes against us, to get so myopically focused just right on what's going on and forget the history of events, all the stuff from, from your birth till now that you went through that God used to grow us. It's easy for me to forget when I was three years old and seared my fingers to the top of the cookie sheet. That's easy to forget when I'm in the midst of this issue, this tough thing. But that's exactly what God's trying to get me to do, is to go back up, brother. Back up, my child, and look around. You've been here before. Trust in me. Have faith. I'm going to get you through. Now look at the next verse. Look at verse 5. Now we're going to look at what God does. His assistance for the trials. Look at what he's going to do. He says, now in the midst of this, if any of you lacks wisdom, this is Sophia. This is the, the working knowledge, the map in other words, this map that will get you through the trials. If you just don't know what you're doing, guess what? Look at the verse. Let him ask of God who gives to all generously without reproach. In other words, in the midst of your confusion and your frustration, if you can't get through this, if you just can't see how uh, you can plow through this anymore, ask me. Come to me. Is God not generous? Is God not gracious? Has he not spilled his blood on the cross for you and me? Is he not just going to go, suck it up, buddy? Is that what he's going to do? Do you think when my son came to me and he said, Dad, help me out here, that I didn't love him, that I didn't care? No, but you know what I did? I coached him. I said, here's how you play here, buddy. And I told him what to do to play in the midst of this. That's what he does. He's not, don't, don't, don't expect that God's going to go, that you're going to cry out, God, take this from me. And he's going to go, okay, and just whip it away. You remember what Christ did as he's going to the cross? He's in the garden of Gethsemane. What does he pray? What does he, what does he pray? Take this, God, if it's your will. But if it's not, your will be done. And that's our prayer. God, yeah, God, if you can get this, this, is, this would be helpful for me to take this away. But you know what? I'm willing and ready to stand through it with you, with me. He says, if you lack wisdom, you ask. I will give generously. Keep looking back at your text. Verse 6, but he must ask in faith without doubting. In other words, don't go, uh, don't go to God and say, hey, would you, can you help me out here? If you can. The idea is, do, do you really think that God can't do anything? You know, it's interesting. Benchmark Bible Church started two years ago. And look at where we're at. God can do anything. He can do anything. He doesn't need, he doesn't need our help. Although He asks us to do, He asks us to be involved. He can do whatever He wants. Whatever He wants. Look at, look at the text. But we must ask with faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea. The point is that if, if, you're don't, if you don't trust in Him, you're just all over the place. It's not about who He is. It's about you trusting in who He is. For anyone who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the waves. For, the, the, uh, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So God is there in the midst of all this. And you know what? Like I said, it's not necessarily going to be the, let me jerk you out of this and just save you and put you on a mountaintop somewhere with a load of cash and a new house and a new car and make all of your troubles go away. But what it is, it's the assistance that you need to get through it, to weather it, to shelter in it, right? Look at the verse 9. Now we're going to see him change. He's going to give us a perspective. See, a lot of this is all about 
perspective. How we see things. Sometimes if we just change the aspect of our situation, the, the way we see it, it'll change, it'll change the whole trial that we're going through. If we could step into it with a, a different point of view, maybe we'll see it differently. Look at the text. Verse 9 says, But the brother in humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. In other words, keep your eyes on the eternal ball. He's specifically speaking here of socioeconomic situation. So the Jews had this idea that if you were wealthy, if you had a lot, you must be blessed by God. If you had uh, tons of money and, and, and tons of stuff, if you were one of the elite, you must, God must be on your side no matter how you lived or how you acted. And he says here, he says, the brother of humble means, of humble circumstances, should glory in his high position. In other words, he's destroying this idea that just because you don't have, that somehow there's something wrong with you or that God has just put this trial on you for a reason. And then he flips it and he says, also, and the rich man is to glory in his humility. Why? Because like the flowering grass, he will pass away. We are all in this same boat together. You know, one of the coolest things that me and Jolene ever learned uh, about ourselves in this whole uh, process of, of starting Benchmark Bible Church is this. Everybody's going through a lot of stuff. Okay, so I did student ministry for 19 years, if you can't tell. <laughs> and in my student ministry days, we spent so much time with kids that all we saw were just these, I don't want to call them petty, okay, because they're not, they're kids, they're going through stuff too. But we saw these issues and we really didn't see what the family was going through a lot of times because we were sheltered from that by just being so focused on trying to keep this kid from sleeping with his best friend and whatever, you know, I don't know, smoking paint, all right? So that was our, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> youth ministry was simple in the day. Just don't smoke paint, boy. Um, <laughs> and we didn't see just all the families are going through. And then as we started Benchmark Bible Church and we started actually living in community with you guys, we all started doing this thing together. You know what we realized? There's not a single person sitting in this room that's not hurting in some way on a regular basis. And I'm not necessarily saying that your world is caving in on you. But I'm saying that everyone in here has their stuff. Their pains, their issues, their trials, their struggles. And you know what's, what's sad is that probably most of you sit in this room, you come to church, and you don't know that. I don't know about you, but I lived for a long period of my life thinking, God, why is this only happening to me? Have you ever felt that way? I bet you have. See, the reality is that there's not a person in this room who doesn't have to deal with the realities of life. And it's such, a, it's such an encouragement to know that, that you're suffering too. <laughs> as sad as that is, I just want to know that I'm not alone, that you've been there too, that you're going through too. And you know what it makes? It makes it easier for me to come up next to you and go, come here. It's going to be okay. I know. We just got to hang in there. We encourage each other. And we walk with each other. So it's the aspect with which we see this stuff. Right? Keep looking at your text. Verse 11. The sun rises and scorching wind and withers this grass and the flower falls off and the, its beauty and its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Just give you a quick uh, stupid illustration, but I thought it was good. Um... I was sitting in the bathroom the other day. Oh, that was bad. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. I walked into the bathroom and I saw this toilet paper holder. <laughs> Let's stop for a second because I'll edit that out. <laughs> now we'll pick up. I have an illustration for you. I found this in your bathroom. <laughs> it's a toilet paper holder if you didn't figure that out. And as I was looking at it, I, I, if you look at it from the side, it's a rectangle, right? See that? If you look at it from the side, it's a rectangle. This is easy. This is fourth grade math, right? But if you look at it from the end, it's a circle. 
So what is it? Is it a rectangle or is it a circle? Is it a rectangle? Is it a circle? Well, hang on, because your perspective will determine what it is, right? If you're looking at it from the side and I'm going, hey, look, I've got a rectangle in my hand. And you're over here and you're going, no, 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 you've got a circle in your hand. You see the point here? The, it's the, how we see it. And it's not either one, is it? It's a cylinder. It's not a rectangle or a circle, but our perspective oftentimes, like I said, we get so focused on our, the way we see things, and we forget that God's going here, no, 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 no. It's neither one of that. Just trust me. I'm going to get you through this. Look back at your text. In verse 12, now we're going to see what happens. So you've gotten through this thing. You're on the other side of it. You've trusted in the Lord. What's the aftermath of, of working with God and not just bitterly uh, fighting against what's going on? Look what happens. Blessed. Stop. Makar eos. Makar eos. Happy. The Greek word is happy. Is the man who perseveres under trials. For once he has been approved, accepted, that's the word, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know what this crown of life is? It's life. It's life. You'll receive life. And notice... The qualification for this life is for those who love Him, right? That's part of this process is that as you're going through this with God, your relationship with Him is being solidified. You know, um, as Quinn was, uh, I can remember, uh, as we play, get every game when we get done, you know what I do with those kids? They get done playing basketball. They've worked. They've sweated. They've, they've worked real hard, and they're just beat up. I go, and I, I, I grab them. I hug them. I rub their head. I say, I'm so proud of you. You played so hard. I love watching you play. That's my favorite thing to say to kids. Can you, you remember when, when you played? Don't you just want somebody to say that they loved watching you play? I say, I loved watching you play. I'm so proud of you. Good job. I know it was hard. Great job. You know what that does with mine and these kids' relationship? They love me. <laughs> They love me. They just can't wait till Coach Wilson shows up again. Coach Wilson, I, I show up in the gym, they come running. Because I'm with them in the midst of this. I haven't abandoned them and I love them and they love me. That's the aftermath. Now, let's, let's do this. Let's look at this from a useful point of view. What are some truths we can use? How do we take this and now mix it in to our life? So that when we walk in this earth, uh, and when we face these things, that we don't just uh, call Christianity uh, uh, a, a religion of rules, but we say, no, 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 this stuff actually works. So the first thing I would say is this. Christianity does not immunize us from the realities of life. Christianity does not immunize us from the realities of life. An immunization is a, a shot that prevents you from getting the sick bug or whatever it is, right? That's immunization. Christianity doesn't do that. And anyone who teaches that Christianity will all of a sudden, you just become a Christian and, and your life will be perfect, is on crack. It's just, a, it's imaginative. It's, it doesn't, it's not that way. You and all of us sitting in here are a testament to that, correct? But what it can do is it can shelter us. A great illustration here is we live in tornado world, right? If you've ever been affected by tornadoes, you know what it's like to have a shelter, a proper shelter. I grew up in, in Rome, Texas, and we actually had a big concrete cellar in the ground at our house. And it was, it was just good to know that if a tornado came, all we had to do was run out and get in the cellar. It didn't matter. The whole world could get destroyed. But that cellar, six feet underground, you're safe. Now, did, does the cellar stop the tornado? Well, no. The cellar doesn't stop the tornado. Does the cellar uh, uh, make the, 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 the tornado a figment of your imagination? No. Your house may still be destroyed. Your world may still be turned upside down. But guess what? You shelter it. You're sheltered in it. It provides a place for you to ride it out. Christianity doesn't immunize us from the realities of life, but it is a shelter for us. 
The next thing I want you guys to see is that trials work for us, not against us. And I think a lot of times we get bitter, especially, especially if you've been on the ropes for a while, if you've been just being hammered by the world, and then he, the world kind of backs off and then comes at you again, and it's been happening over and over and over. You know what our tendency is? It's to get bitter. And when that happens, now the trial is not working for you. It's doing what it's not meant to do. It's not meant to make you bitter at God and mad at the world. It's actually to work for you. There's a reason for it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, it says, For momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. Far beyond comparison. This life, as the... Uh, as the uh, as Solomon said in, in Ecclesiastes, is vanity, is but a vapor. And what you're going through, it, it's far outweighed by the glory that, that God has for us on the other side. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but which are the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. Do you know that Thomas Edison... He tried unsuccessfully 1,000 times to create the light bulb. Now, I don't know about you, but about the fourth time in, I'm done. Let's do something else. What else could we invent? Right? 1,000 times. I want, you, I, I, I want you to think about this when you're dying. Okay, Put this thought in your mind. So right before you die, think this thought. I'm going to ask God on the other side of this. How many trials did I go through? I guarantee it's probably more than a thousand in your lifetime. Just remember that, okay? As you're dying, remember, I'm going to ask him how many times, how many trials did I go through? And then when you get on the other side, hey, 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 I got a question before I forget it. <laughs> I guarantee he's going to go, ha, 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 buddy. And he's going to give you a number and you're going to go, really? Because it's more than a thousand. Here's another point, uh, a truth that I think we can use. Not only is the trials work for us and not against us, trials rightly used are built for our maturity. They're to help us mature. Can you imagine? I want you to just imagine being who you were in junior high forever. That's just torture. I don't want to be I don't want to be that kid gangly and skinny and nothing that came out of my mouth was coherent S still kind of not but no one wants to be that kid we all want to grow up into maturity I can remember asking my parents when am I going to be tall when am I going to be strong I kept I used to ask my 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 parents this will I be as tall as so and so will I be as strong as this guy dad will I be as strong as you will, will I will I look like you because I wanted so badly to not be a child anymore how come so often we as Christians just are content we're content just staying children in our faith just the maturity level of a puddle when God has built us to be an ocean. Because trials are there for that reason. You and I might build up endurance and perseverance that we might be perfected, lacking nothing. Then here's the last one. Here's the last one. You're not alone. You're not alone. I've, I, I hesitated putting this, this little point. Matter of fact, this was a, an afterthought after I'd written this entire uh, sermon and put it together. I, I thought at the very end, I put this in because I think it's probably actually the most important thing that you can know from this text. The most important thing you can walk away with is you're not alone. I know you may think you are. I know it may feel like you are. But you are not. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says this. Be sober in spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to destroy. That's what you're up against. 
You're not up against random chance. You've got a guy. You've got a demonic, uh, angelic demonic force out there that's going after you. This isn't like things are randomly uh, are going to appear. God is allowing things for a reason. And here's what you do. Verse 9, but resist him. Firm in your faith. This is what James is talking about. Peter's re re reiterating the same thing. Firm in your faith. You stand true and you trust in God, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers who are n all over the world. You know, it's really great. You should do this sometime. It'll make you feel a lot better. You ever seen a publication called The Voice of the Martyrs? There's a magazine that goes around. Uh, there's a book called Jesus Freaks. You can, it's, a, it's a great little book put together. And it's all stories about people who have died for their faith. You've got to go read it. It'll show, it'll put perspective on what we're going through with God. And it'll make you rejoice. It'll make you rejoice.